speaker of the session is Ahmed from uh, UMD, and he's going to be telling us about the Ring of Gyges. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, cryptocurrency and crime, mainly in the context of smart contracts. Uh, we've already seen in the previous two talks how smart contracts can be used to uh, support many interesting applications. But in the same time, we should not forget that the uh, rise of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin in particular, uh, has catalyzed and stim stimulated lots of uh, criminal activity. Uh, which means we need to study the dark side of smart contracts and how far criminals can make use of them uh, to do harmful stuff. So uh, this, uh, this joint work with Professors Air Jules from Cornell Tech and Elaine Shi from Cornell, and this research is done within the uh, Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Smart Contracts. So in case you're wondering about the ring, let me start first with this um, thought-provoking discussion about anonymity and crime. So in Plato's book, uh, The Republic, there was this interesting discussion about um, the origin of justice and morality. And it took place as a conversation between uh, Socrates and Plato's brother, uh, Glaucon. So Glaucon was arguing that um, morality or justice is the result of, uh, is a social construct. People behave morally because they can be held accountable for their actions. Once you take accountability away, they are not uh, expected to act this way. And he uh, recounts this myth where uh, uh, a shepherd of a king named Gyges found this ring that made him invisible, and he used it to uh, seduce a queen and murder the king and um, uh, overtake the, take over the throne of, uh, of the kingdom. And the question is, what if you give this ring to uh, normal people? Are they going to act morally or they are going to abuse it? So uh, Glaucon was uh, arguing that um, he doesn't think people would act morally in that case. Uh, Socrates on the other side had a different opinion that morality or justice is the result of uh, self-control, which can lead to happiness. But what we care about here is that, um, sorry, that Glaucon is certainly right about some people. Uh, for sure, if you give this strength to some people, they are going to abuse it. And we have seen this already in many cases. Uh, we have seen that anonymity can make some people mean. For example, on social networks websites, that provide anonymity to its users. Many cases of cyberbullying were reported and in some cases associated with uh, suicide cases. And you can expect that, okay, there's some delay here. You can expect that if you add money to the equation, you'd expect those some people to be meaner. And this is what we have seen already with the rise uh, of Bitcoin. Although Bitcoin doesn't really give full anonymity, but still um, uh, criminals found it uh, attractive. And we've seen that Bitcoin has stimulated already theft Bitcoin wallets, illicit marketplaces, rogue mining, and um, like zero access, and ransomware. And in many cases, Bitcoin is not really creating new kinds of crimes. For example, compare this 1989 Trojan, which uh, encrypted users' file systems and required them to send paper payments to Panama. Of course, you can expect that something like this is easy, like can be easily traced. And actually, like the one who launched this attack was arrested in the end. Compare this, for example, to CryptoLocker, which also like, has the same idea, encrypts users' files, but require them just to um, send some Bitcoins to um, some address within 72 hours. Otherwise, their files are gone. So you, you'd see here that Bitcoin has somehow provided this superior customer service to criminals. And the and what we need to uh, observe here is that why Bitcoin was good for crime. So first of all, it gives some sense of anonymity. You can't uh, figure out the identity of a user uh, based, on its, uh, based on the public key. Although, of course, technically Bitcoin is just pseudo-anonymous and same address transactions are linkable. And uh, there are many works on mining transaction data and like uh, uh, tracing thieves and so on. But still, it, criminals would find it more attractive than uh, centralized options. And the second, of course, is that Bitcoin runs in a decentralized manner. No need for trusted third party. No one can stop the transaction. And, sorry. and of course, all of this happens while we only have little support for transactions beyond money transfer. So let's see what the future is bringing us. So the new cryptocurrencies are bringing um, stronger anonymity, and we have seen this already in new cryptocurrencies like Zero Cash and Zero Coin, um, and Binocchio Coin. This is mainly uh, because of the increasingly efficient non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs or zero-knowledge snarks. Uh, 
Uh, the second is that smart contracts are also decentralized, so they give the same features as Bitcoin, but also they, as we've seen, uh, as we've seen in the previous two talks, they give much more functionality on top of, uh, on, on top of Bitcoin. And of course, it does not require direct interaction with, uh, between parties. Okay, so it seems that the remote is delaying. So we would expect after all these features that uh, more serious crime. And this is what we try to investigate and predict in this paper. So I'm going to talk directly about criminal smart contracts, about how criminals can make use of uh, smart contracts to do harmful things. Um, so a criminal smart contracts mainly would try to help the criminals we'd expect in, in these two ways. So first of all, it's going to reduce the trust requirements because typical uh, criminal transactions have some reliance on um, intermediaries that make the crime possible. And this is actually dangerous because you can't trust anyone these days because they may turn out in the end to be the FBI. And this is what happened in uh, the case of dark market where it was infiltrated by the FBI and one admin of the site turned out to be an FBI agent in the end. And the second is, of course, the interference by law enforcement itself. So if you have an intermediary like a site, um, uh, the law enforcement can interfere and stop or take down the site. So how smart contracts try to, like, can help with this? It, uh, they provide fair exchange and minimized interaction, minimized trust, and also auto autonomous execution. Uh, we have to note here, just for uh, technical reasons now, is that fair exchange is necessary for most for most of Kremlin smart contracts, but um, it's not sufficient. We will see this in, in some examples. And we define commission fairness as uh, both commission of a crime and commensurate payment for the perpetrator of the crime. Don't worry, like, I will get to this um, in detail right now. Okay, so I'm going to discuss uh, three criminal smart contracts. I'm going to start the first one with uh, this leakage of secrets. Uh, let me start actually with a Bitcoin-based attempt to do a crime to do some leakage of secrets. So this is an existing Bitcoin-based attempt to uh, achieve uh, criminal smart contracts. It works like a subsidized WikiLeaks for leaking all this kind of stuff, like Hollywood movies, government secrets, uh, pictures, zero-day exploits, everything, or almost everything. And the way it works is that a hacker or a leaker that has access to these secret materials uh, goes online, offers, or announces that he, he has this kind of material. The interested purchasers uh, will be able to inspect some parts of this material. If they liked it, they're going to offer some money. And then, uh, in order for um, the leaker here to, like, to spend this money, he has to review the rest of, of the leaked material. Okay, so technically it works this way. We will see now how this is flowed, how smart contracts can, can help in this case. So the contractor in the beginning would offer to leak some secret M, let's say M this uh, Hollywood movie like Captain America or something. So the contractor in the beginning would prefer an offering, would partition this M to uh, N segments, and encrypt each segment under a symmetric key, KI. And he, after the encryption, he's going to publish the ciphertext somewhere. And at some point in the future, he's going to reveal a random subset of these keys. The randomness here can be obtained from the blockchain. For example, uh, the contractor can say, I'm going to take the randomness of uh, the 100th block from now to use, like, to generate a random sample and reveal these keys. Now, the purchasers would be able to decrypt the sample, and if they like it, they are going to provide the offer. And on accepting the offer, the contractor is going to reveal the remaining set of keys. Okay? Now, the question is how to do this uh, on top of the blockchain. So it turns out that there is a Bitcoin-based approach already to handle this. But since, uh, okay, let me start with this first. We need to make sure first that this happens in a fair exchange way. So as soon as the money goes to the contractor, all the movie must go to the purchasers. This all should happen in one operation. We would see now how a Bitcoin approach does not achieve this as a really atomic operation, but in dark leaks, they use a clever trick in order to um, have this done. So remember in Bitcoin, um, a Bitcoin address that we pay to is a hash of the public key. And the observations here is that payments are issued to the address, but from the address alone, it's, def uh, it's practically infeasible to determine the public key. But the public key must be revealed in order to spend from uh, this address. And the way dark leaks work, 
is that uh, the, the contractor is going to uh, create a set of n accounts in the beginning, like you, you imagine an account for every segment. And the symmetric key is going to be generated based on the public key, not from the address, it's just from the public key. And the, when the purchasers see the sample, they are going to deposit the offer uh, for uh, certain MIs with, with these addresses. In order for the contractor to spend the money from the addresses, you know, like he must review the public keys. And in this case, the purchasers would be able to use these KIs to generate the BKIs and, uh, or sorry, uh, we would be able to see the BKIs and make you, like, uh, generate the actual symmetric, key, uh, symmetric encryption key and decrypt the files back. So there are, some, there are clearly some problems with this approach. So first of all, it's not, true, uh, it's not really true fair exchange because there can be a delayed release here. The contractor can claim the money after the movie goes stale, like after it gets uh, like released. Also, there, c there can be a partial withholding happening here. So uh, the contractor can choose not to reveal the keys for some certain parts. So he, he can let the money uh, kept, uh, be kept forever in some addresses. And of course, all this happens uh, under or like provides public leakage only because all the public keys are being revealed in public in the end. So what we're saying here is that it's provide public leakage only, and the private leakage here is not possible because the contractor can't release exclusively to some uh, certain purchaser's key. Uh, how Kremlin smart contracts for dark leaks can help? It can force an atomic ex exchange, and it can actually require the contractor to deposit um, uh, some initial deposit to the contract such that it can't abort from the protocol, and it also it can specify a certain time out for the exchange. And the, con the contract as well can support the case of private leakage. So in our paper, we show uh, how to do this in detail. So we have a public leakage implementation for uh, like doing the functions of dark leaks. And also, we argue in the online version how to, how uh, the construction of a private leakage version is, is possible. Okay. So this was the first type of uh, Kremlin smart contract. The second one is uh, about cryptographic key thefts. So the previous one was really enhancing some Bitcoin-based crime. Now let's see some new kinds of crimes. So for cryptographic key thefts, we mainly here care about the keys of cer certificates. So we know that certificates authenticate SSL, TLS connections, and code updates. And certificates is usually digitally signed by some certificate authority with this secret key and public key. And it's of course known that forged certificates are very valuable. You can use them to launch uh, many kinds of attacks, sign malicious hardware, uh, sorry, malicious software, as in the case of Stuxnet, and so on. And what we, what we would like to see here, whether it is going to be possible for criminals to construct a criminal smart contract for encrypted delivery of a private key under some uh, public key of a contractor. We would like to see whether something like this is going to be practical or not. Okay. So let's, let, okay, let's start first with a naive version of a contract that uh, supports this. So, so uh, suppose the contractor would construct a contract this way. It's going to provide uh, a public key of the contractor, uh, the, its public encryption key, and the target public key of the certificate authority. And um, when it receives a cipher text and a proof from uh, a perpetrator that it could uh, find out the secret key of this certain public key, it is going to send a reward to this perpetrator. Okay? Of course, spy here is uh, a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof that proves this, this relation. Now, there are some clear problems with this approach. So the victim um, certificate authority can neutralize this kind of contract. So it can revoke its own public key and claim the reward. Okay? So it, it turns out that a problem like this is uh, solvable. But what we would like to show here is that really fair exchange does n is not equivalent to commission fairness. Okay? Because in the previous attack, it's fair exchange, but it does not help with the purpose of the crime. So it turns out that there is a countermeasure to this uh, revocation attack. And since um, like revoking a public key is uh, 
is typically a, a public act by a certificate authority. So the contract can be enhanced to accept a proof of revocation, and the contractor can provide this proof of revocation to show that the perpetrator does not uh, deserve this award, or this reward. And in the paper, we discuss how this reward should be uh, computed as a function of the period of vulnerability of uh, the secret key. The second problem is that such contracts are public state. So the target certificate authority would be able to know that it has been uh, under attack and its secret key has been revealed. Okay? So to solve this as well, like criminals can uh, can think about, like, can create a multi-target contract that instead of just targeting one certificate authority or one certificate, they can just target all the signing keys of uh, the 600 CAs uh, recognized by the current uh, Internet Explorer. Now, the CA doesn't learn exactly whether it was targeted successfully or specifically. Also, in the paper, we show that there can be other technical uh, solutions for this problem. Now the question is, like, after we increase this number of keys and uh, certificate authorities, uh, would it be practical to launch or like to have this kind of contract? So this is the question we an like we answered. So the main bottleneck here is that we need a fancy non-interactive knowledge proof that proves this relation, that uh, certain ciphertext is the encryption of the uh, leaked secret key under the public key of the contractor. And we consider these two cases. Uh, when the secret key is either an RSA or ECDSA key, or, and when the public key, when the encryption happens under an RSA uh, 20, yeah, just a second, uh, 2048. So we constructed Ezekiel uh, circuits for uh, verifying uh, this relationship. We, we actually built the custom circuits using Zika snark library, LibSnark, and these are the results. The results turned out to, like to show practical performance. So uh, the main important thing here is what happens on top of the blockchain. So the blockchain in this case for a 500 target contract will just need to spend 8 milliseconds to verify the proof and the size of the proof is just very succinct, just 700 bytes. All the other parts that's done, the, either the proof construction or the one-time setup, all, all, this, all these parts happen outside the blockchain. So this concludes the second part of the uh, the second Kremlin smart contract that we discussed. Uh, so far, what we have discussed are just digital world crimes. The third possibility that we thought about is, are we, like, is whether Kremlin smart contracts can be used to launch real world attacks. And uh, we refer to this as calling card crimes. Can, it, like, can smart contracts be used to do things like assassination or arson or terrorism and so on? So I'm going to go very briefly about this for the sake of time. So suppose uh, some criminal contractor offers a reward for assassination of some politician X or something. Now, for a contract to uh, for for a contract on the blockchain to uh, to work correctly here, it needs to verify that an assassination or a certain crime happened, and it needs to make sure that a certain perpetrator was behind this um, this kind of attack. So it turns out that in th in the future these things might be possible. Because in the first one, like we have just seen in the previous talk in Town Crier, we can have an authenticated data feed reporting from news reports about crimes and uh, other things. The second one is that it can be solved using this concept of a calling card. A calling card is uh, some kind of object that usually left by criminals or like serial, uh, serial killers to claim crimes. So the way it, it can be like done in a case like this a criminal would send a cryptographic commitment of some details that he only knows about the crime, like a day or time on the method of the crime, and then after there is a report or an authenticated data feed reporting the crime, he can reveal the details of uh, this crime and claim the reward. Of course, there are some practical uh, issues here, like we show that uh, criminals can find a way to get over them in, in, in our paper. Uh, before we get to a quick discussion about the defenses. We also in the paper show that uh, the technology of trusted hardware can enable other kind of crimes like password thefts and, uh, and so on. So regarding the defenses of this, of course the purpose of, all, of, of studying all this not to come up with new crimes, but of course is to 
uh, is to have uh, an on-time strategy to, uh, to fix all this in time. Especially that most of the crimes that we discussed so far is, uh, can be implemented directly now. Like for example, the second one, which requires ZK-SNARK support on top of the blockchain, it's not currently supported, but Ethereum developers have shown support, uh, have shown interest in order uh, like to integrate op codes of, uh, of verifying SNARK uh, proofs on top of the blockchain. And of course, the previous one, the calling card, requires town crier in place. So regarding the defenses, it turns, it turns out that this is actually a difficult problem. Of course, we don't want to ban decentralized smart contracts because they also uh, have many good applications. Blacklisting coins and transactions. Of course, this undercuts fungibility, and we will get back to the centralized problem about who would compose these blacklists and so on. Um, there are also other techniques and literature, things related to anonymity, uh, Revocation, but this requires a, a, another kind of setting uh, where users would prove identities to third parties and so on. What we hope by, by this work is increasing awareness of the, dangerous, uh, of the dangers smart contracts can introduce. And we believe that as what happened in Bitcoin, there can be an ecosystem here for detecting criminal smart contracts and uh, warning against them. And also we mention uh, a more strict approach in the paper. It's called trustee neutralizable smart contracts. There could be a committee or something that, um, that based on, um, uh, like after discovering a certain criminal smart contract, they may decide to remove it from the blockchain. Also, they can tell the miners uh, not to uh, support the transaction to a certain contract and so on. So I don't want to, you to leave like with the impression that smart contracts are bad. So like, Remember that smart contracts can also be a force of good. Uh, they can enable many financial instruments and so on. Also, our exploration for Kremlin smart contracts has helped produce uh, new mechanisms for, for fair contract constructions, also supporting formalism, uh, like we have all this kind of proofs in UC framework in, in the paper. And also, like, there can be good Kremlin smart contracts. Uh, like, there can, the calling card one, for example, can be used for anonymous return of for stolen art, artwork. So in conclusion, okay, smart contracts are interesting and are going to provide many uh, interesting applications on top of the blockchain. But in the same time, we should not forget that Bitcoin catalyzed, the rise of Bitcoin catalyzed a lot of criminal activity. And uh, because smart contracts are going to provide much more functionality, we have to uh, take some steps against their dark side in an early stage especially that uh, Ethereum has just set, uh, like hit one million market, uh, market cap. And at this point, as I said, the defenses are unclear, but this is just a call for prompt action. Thank you. I, uh, this is just a clarification question. Uh, the trusted key setup that you do in your stock circuits, does that actually require, like, is it a trusted setup or like, is it an untrusted? You're talking about the trusted key setup in the snarks, right? Yes. Okay, so in, in this kind of crime, the, the contractor himself can construct this, uh, this key. The okay. contractor would ask uh, for, to get a key that breaks a certain public key, is uh -huh. the one who can does this construction. Okay, okay, so there's no need for the yeah. contract. Like there, there is one case where uh, like when he submits a revocation proof, and we discussed this in the paper, like in this, like there is one case uh, that I didn't cover here where, the, uh, where, where there must be a trusted setup that's done uh, outside. outside. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, very nice talk. Can you, can you elaborate a bit on the defense you mentioned that relies on a, on a trustee? I mean, if you bring a trustee back into the picture, why do you need smart contracts? Yeah, okay, so right. as I said, like, I, like, I um, acknowledge that there is always a concern about this, but the, this was just for the sake of discussion about what, um, what could be possible approaches for taking out Kremlin smart contracts out of the network. Because, uh, like, actually what we say in our paper, we are not sure whether an approach like this would be... Um, attractive for the cryptocurrency community because, of course, this requires some centralized uh, authority somehow. Precisely. So the paper seems to be much stronger on attacks than on defenses, right? 
so, and, and the conclusion is pretty, from what I understand, is pretty negative because it showed that the upper full attacks and the defenses are either uh, increasing awareness, but we know that awareness doesn't work in security, right? Let's face it. Or uh, bringing back a centralized trustee, which essentially defeats the purpose of the whole thing, right? So, so are you really bringing good news? Well, uh, so like, uh, I acknowledge that the defenses for this is like we don't claim that there is a successful defense. Like the main purpose of the paper is to highlight that this problem is challenging and there is no straightforward defense against um, this kind of contract. Like every defense that I discussed usually has a drawback. Like uh, I admit, like we don't have um, something that would work in a robust way against all cases. Just to clarify, you don't actually need a, a centralized arbitrator. The arbitration process for whether a contract is good or bad could be done in a decentralized way. You can have people vote up for it, right? So it's just, just as a Yeah, so, so the, the idea here presents like, uh, if, the, if, if most of the uh, smart contract users agree that a certain contract is, uh, like is going to cause crime, or if there's an ecosystem that agrees on this, maybe it can, it can be used that. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, Thanks. Marco Kolbas from Microsoft Research. So I have a quick technical question. So you mentioned this uh, 86 milliseconds, I think, of verifying a uh, snark. So is, did you implement that in, for Ethereum? And what, what is the cost in, in gas, for instance? OK, so um, this is not implemented directly in Ethereum, because Ethereum does not have uh, currently support for zero, uh, like zero knowledge snarks on top of the blockchain. What we can do is that like, we implemented a separate prototype for this, and we get the benchmarks uh, like out of a real implementation. OK, but you would have to implement that in Solidity or? No, no. I mean, like, th this can't, I mean, this is not oh, straightforward yeah. to be done on top of Solidity, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask how your implementation of the movie exchange algorithm compares to Gregory Maxwell's contingent payment system. Uh, can you repeat it again, please? So uh, last February, uh, Gregory Maxwell of Bitcoin invented uh, the contingent payments, zero knowledge contingent payments. Are you aware of their work? Yeah, like I, I, like, I know an idea about it, but like. So, so how do, uh, I wanted to ask if you have some comparison of your work against that, and um, if you no, can achieve like, the same things. We don't have the direct comparison. Like we didn't involve a zero knowledge contingent payments in, uh, okay. in, in this work. I'd like to ask, how does this work compare to uh, decentralized markets, where you have a decentralized reputation system? OK, so what, what we are saying here is that a criminal smart contracts can give much more than uh, this, this kind of markets, because this kind of markets may rely on some website to manage uh, the interactions or some parties in some intermediaries. But smart contracts would give uh, much more minimized trust in these cases. For example, in the assassination contract or in the uh, key leakage and so on, the contractor would just post this contract and just leaves it. He doesn't need to interact anymore with this contract. This is why uh, we warn against this kind of stuff. So all the dark markets stuff can be infiltrated by the law enforcement, can be stopped by, uh, the websites can be uh, interrupted by the law enforcement, but the case of criminal smart contracts can be a little bit more difficult. Okay, uh, I think that's it for the session. So uh, let's thank Ahmed and all the speakers again. Thanks.